homicide detective, a feat made all the more incredible when you factor in that she was African American. During her time as a homicide detective, Jenkins mainly investigated the deaths of younger victims, children and infants. These were the types of cases her male colleagues couldn't seem to stomach. One of those heartbreaking cases stood out, however. Most remarkably, because it wasn't even a case she was directly involved with, but rather one she watched unfold from afar. The case continues to haunt her even two decades after her retirement. was a sixth grader at Kelly Miller Junior High School. The 12-year-old girl lived with her father and stepmother in an apartment at Northeast Benning Road. Nino's stepmother, having recently given birth, was staying at the hospital whilst the girl's father juggled his time between home and there, taking care of both Nino, his wife, and a newborn baby. This leads up to the events of October 1st, 1971. It had been over two months since the discovery of Brenda's body, and now, on the other side of town, Nino found herself walking alongside the road, even as the evening approached at the quickened pace of the incoming golden months of year's end. sent out for groceries at a nearby Safeway store, less than a block away from where she lived. She was out to buy sugar, flour, and paper plates, and all indications would point out to her having done so, seeing as a store clerk would later recognize her through photographs, stating that she was there around 7 p.m. However, later that night, a Safeway employee found the items the girl had purchased scattered along the street outside the store. Less than three hours after Nino's mysterious disappearance, her body would be found just off the shoulder of Pennsylvania Avenue in Maryland. The remains were found by a mere coincidence when a 16-year-old hitchhiker stumbled upon them. Nino was fully clothed, minus her shoes, and had been strangled to death. Coroners would later note that the strangulation was excessive, with the girl's esophagus having been shattered. Additionally, Nino too had been sexually assaulted before death. Green fibers again would be found on her body, linking her definitively to both Carol and Brenda's case. The investigation into the abduction and murder of Nino Yates was just as unusual as the first three murder cases. Witnesses were mostly unhelpful with the exception of a neighbor who saw her get into a blue Volkswagen. It was a better lead than most, However, during 1971, finding the driver of a blue Volkswagen was like finding a needle in a haystack. It came as no surprise, due to the police's seemingly unethical apathy, that they officially linked the deaths of these four young black girls only when Nino's body was found and examined, having made little to no effort before to join the cases and alert the public to the happenstance. Following this development and having been singled out as the murders of a dangerous serial killer, the FBI became involved with their investigation. Criminal profiling was still at its infancy, but the FBI were eager to help solve the case by whichever means available, labeling their murderer a dangerous repeat offender. The name Freeway Phantom was coined by reporters at the now defunct tabloid The Daily News, 
who noticed that all of the victims had been left alongside major roads and freeways. The nickname would stick, and the killer himself seemed to embrace it. Brenda Denise Woodard was an 18-year-old teenager living with her family in Baltimore, Maryland, when in the fall of 1971, she began taking night classes to improve her working skills. On the evening of November 15, 1971, Brenda met up with a classmate and the two had dinner together. Following a casual meal, they each began heading home. Usually he would drive them both, but his car was getting repaired, so they rode together on a bus. Eventually, they had to split up, so Brenda said goodbye to her classmate and left the bus to catch a transfer. She hopped off to the next one, and that is when her trail goes cold. In the early morning of November 16th, hours after Brenda was last seen by her classmate, police officer David Norman came upon her body. I shined my flashlight into her eyes to see if there was life. She didn't blink. She didn't do anything the officer would later recall. Morbidly, Brenda's body had been left near a bus stop her mother used every day. When police were securing the scene, she would unknowingly stumble upon the commotion. That was when she learned of her 18-year-old daughter's brutal murder. Like the first four victims, Brenda was strangled. Yet it seemed as though her end had been even more violent than theirs. In addition to the stab wounds, Investigators considered bizarre that she was found still wearing her shoes. Most astonishing, however, was when investigators searched the coat covering her body to find a note directed to them. The note was compared to Brenda's handwriting and the FBI found it likely that the killer had forced her to write the note before he killed her. A further examination of Brenda's clothing found amongst it two hairs, one which was thought to be of a Caucasian male and the other of an African-American man. Despite finding the evidence early on, police was unable to confirm if either of those samples had come from the killer. With the noticeable differences that set this case apart from the previous others, police struggled with the idea that it was the same offender as before. Brenda Woodard was older, and the minuscule similarities between previous murders of the supposed freeway phantom weren't present at her murder scene, like the missing shoes that were the killer's mementos, green fibers, and again, the fact that she was considerably older than the previous, younger victims that appeared childlike and smaller in frame, a bit unlike Brenda. These and other facts have led people to believe that she was not in fact a victim of the freeway phantom, but of someone else. If that is the case, it perhaps helps explain further developments in this heartbreaking story. For six months, the murderer was active, yet after Brenda's murder, he would cease to exist for close to an entire year. By then, FBI became distracted with other pressing affairs, and the investigation went cold until the killer stroke again. Diane Denise Williams was a 17-year-old known for her impeccable fashion sense. An aspiring model, she had just started her senior year at high school in Washington, D.C. Throughout the summer, Diane had fallen madly in love with her boyfriend and spent most of her time off from school with him. On September 5th, 1972, Diane cooked dinner for her family and then set off to visit her boyfriend for the evening, just like many times before. Diane met with her boyfriend. The time came for her to return home, so he walked her to a bus stop nearby. She kissed him goodbye and caught the bus, safely headed home. 
never made it. The following day, September 6, 1972, her body was discovered by a trucker along Interstate 295, less than two miles away from Diane's home and her intended destination. Police was called to the scene and immediately theorized that Diane had been a victim of the dormant freeway phantom. Her shoes had been removed and her clothes remained the same, yet her footwear was resting neatly against her body, as though the killer had gently or ritually placed them there to be observed as such. In addition, the bottom of her shoes bore the first name, her first name, in big bold letters. Unfortunately, like the other victims, Diane too had been strangled, but no trace of sexual assault was found on her body, only on her clothing, where police officers were able to find traces of semen, which were largely overlooked as being her boyfriend's, despite him denying it multiple times, insisting they had no kind of sexual activity that night. With the FBI far removed, the case within the hands of the previous Metropolitan Police Department, which, once again, allowed the case to go cold. Unable to provide more clues or further explanations into their murders, now six, either direct or indirect victims of the so-called Freeway Phantom. Eventually, the FBI would enter the fray once again, in 1974. The case had become largely stagnant, so they started a task force, which included over 100 detectives and federal agents altogether. Despite police attempting to link other murder cases to those of the Freeway Phantom, they were unsuccessful in doing so, one of them being solved sometime later. There's one case, which Detective Romaine Jenkins believes might be related. The murder of Anne Bryant, killed in November of 1972, two months after the last known Freeway Phantom murder. As this was beyond the date of the known killer's crime spree, it was ruled out due to lack of evidence, while remaining a possibility. All of the victims had a number of traits in common. They were all of African-American families between the ages of 10 and 18, living along the Washington Beltway. Investigators believe they were all kidnapped whilst walking and whose bodies had been left near busy roads such as freeways. Their petite frame stood out, possibly confusing the killer into believing they were even younger and all within the same age range. Three of the victims had been sexually assaulted, including one which was sodomized. Decomposition on Brenda's body meant they couldn't determine whether she too had been sexually assaulted. Additionally, there was semen on the last victim's clothes, which cast doubt on the type of offense he was victim of before death. Lastly, there were the green fibers scattered across their clothes. Despite the FBI's later efforts to aid in covering the police officer's apathy and, most likely, unreasonable racism, the cases have become ice cold, with the investigator's poor judgment and behavior behind much, if not most, of the reason why it has been so. One is safe to assume that the Freeway Phantom is, or was, a pedophile and serial murderer whose victims were sometimes tailed due to their steady routines in the neighboring area before he abducted, raped, brutalized, and then strangled them. Nowadays, it's almost safe to assume 18-year-old Brenda, the second to last victim, was killed by another person, conveniently pretending to be the Phantom. Important to notice is how the victim's race most likely dictated the unfair investigation into their murders, careless and lazy altogether. The area where these crimes unfolded held a predominantly black population. During the 60s and 70s, more than 70% of the region's population was African American who had to endure a lifetime's worth of racial tension and struggles. To residents, the murder of six girls within their community was appalling, and the careless investigation only made it worse still. The police are committing crimes by not taking care of our children, said Glendora Thomas in 1971. As fate would have it, when every successful fight in history is won, like the civil rights movement was, a wave of hatred will follow. 
in the early 70s, a resurgence of hatred bailed six or more deaths of innocent victims, giving them unfair statistics of their case ever being solved. Another stain in mankind's dirty fabric of life, a rag by all means. As decades go by with no further answers, parents, siblings, and friends of the victims have begun to pass away in the years since. But hope remains that one day, the case can be solved.